talk I'm going to give you today um, resonates with discussions that we've been having in lots of the different sessions over the course of the, um, of the last two days. Um, so I'm going to talk to you not about a new technique in development funded archaeology, but more about um, a new approach to doing research in developer funded archaeology. Um, so I'm going to start by um, telling you a little bit about the Rewilding Native Prehistory Project, uh, which is a project I guess we're using as a vehicle to try this out. Um, and then I'll go on to give you a few examples of the kinds of things that we're doing um, in this vein. So the Rewilding Native Prehistory Project, um, Bronze and Iron Age Ecologies from the Perspective of the Wild, it's a UKRI funded future leader fellowship um, based at Oxford Archaeology. Um, it runs for four years, um, starts in September 2022. We're looking at the Bronze and Iron Ages in Britain. Um, and uh, these are all uh, my colleagues at Oxford Archaeology who have funded time on the project that I'm working with. So this is very much a presentation that is presenting the work of many different people. Um, we also have a, a wide suite of partners um, in universities, Historic England, the Archaeology Data Service, um, and Net Castle Estate, who are rewilding partners. So these are our main research questions. First, we want to create a, a novel holistic account of Bronze and Iron Age ecologies in Britain that prioritises the wild. And this is really just to sort of balance out the tendency of most traditional narratives of prehistory to focus on stories of human progress and agricultural revolution, urbanisation, increasing sedentism, and so on. Secondly, we want to develop a new archaeological take on rewilding. Um, and I know that rewilding is a bit of a controversial term, and that's probably why I used it in the title of my project. Um, but, uh, so you can see on the left uh, sort of a, a broad definition of contemporary rewilding in nature conservation settings. What we want to do is ask what wildlife was in past landscapes um, to connect archaeologists with the elements of nature in their, in their evidence space. Um, and to use this as a platform to connect to current nature recovery initiatives. A third major strand of what we're doing is to create, uh, with environmental archaeologists, a centralised, sustainable digital infrastructure for plant and animal remains uh, metadata. And this is really um, about uh, the difficulty of synthesising um, and accessing uh, environmental data in um, British archaeology, um, and this was hit home to me by another great innovation from development-led archaeology. So many of you have come across um, Rob Wiseman's uh, Archaeologists on Furlough project. Um, so Rob Wiseman's based at the Cambridge Archaeological Unit. Um, and uh, in lockdown, he ran a series of projects which harnessed um, the expertise of archaeologists on furlough, mainly who are from development and archaeology, um, to in um, running a series of projects. And this is a this is a key one, which is about um, looking for incidences of prehistoric wall rocks. Um, and this trebled the known number of examples of, of prehistoric wall rocks in Britain, and it really sort of hit home to me how little we actually know about what's out there. Um, and how much work we have to do with our data. And this is really what I'm going to be talking about today mostly. Um, a fourth main aim of the project is to mix up archaeological research dynamics from a situation in which organisations like Oxford Archaeology and other development led organisations are generating data and other people in universities mainly are mining these data and setting the intellectual agendas so a situation in which um, development-led organisations like Oxford Archaeology are at the centre of things, working with a diverse set of partners and maybe doing a different kind of research. So as I said, not a new technique as such, but a new approach that's intent on harnessing the energies and the expertise of archaeologists in development-led organisations for research purposes, to lead cross-disciplinary initiatives, in attending to urgent contemporary matters, in setting intellectual agendas with diverse collaborators, and in shaping a new mode of research. So the, the capital R is about, we hear um, 
again and again in some ways that, you know, all everything that we do in archaeology is research. And at a certain level, that's true. But I'm also very aware that some research is valued more than other research. Um, and it feels like the research that goes on in developer-funded archaeology needs to be valued more like the research that goes on in universities. Or maybe in a different way, but in <laughs> valued properly. So, on to some examples. Um, so, like many synthetic research projects, we've been building a large database of prehistoric evidence for prehistoric life wildlife in Britain. Um, these are our case study areas. Uh, we're focusing on um, rat fossil and vertebrate animal remains. And in many ways, this is a traditional process. Um, uh, we've been very dependent on our, our um, friendly and uh, uh, extremely helpful um, colleagues at the Archaeology Data Services who are using their technical wizardry to help us to massage very diverse, reformatted data into a single, seamless format um, and uploading it to an online database uh, which will be accessible at the end of the project via the ABS. Um, but one thing that we've been doing that's perhaps slightly different is as well as going directly to plant and animal remains specialists for specialist reports and more data for the project, we are also fully costing for their input. And I think this is a big difference to what happens normally in traditional academic research because um, it quite often is, it's expected that people in development led organisations will spend their own time providing information for university based research. And you know, often this is fine, and it's what we all want to do, and it's good. But sometimes it takes days and days and days, and people, it's, it's not very easy to do that within the sort of process of routine work and development led archaeology. So it's very important to me that all the involvement of development led archaeologists in this project was fully possible. And it's hard to know if it's just about the money, but people have been extremely helpful. Um, these are all the people who have provided us data for the project. And so far, um, and I should say that this is um, largely the work of my colleague um, Tina Rusanafas, who's been working, who's sort of leading the work on the, on the database. Um, we've got a database with um, about 900 sites in it, um, 38,000 uh, plants and animal remains records, that's just the presence and absence, there's lots more if you count quantities. Um, and I think towards the end of the project, we'll have about a thousand records, maybe fifty thousand um, plants and animal remains records. So, moving on to sort of leading intellectual agendas um, from development led archaeology with diverse partners, um, these are some of the projects that we started. It has been the second year of um, the Rewilding project. Um, and I'll just run you through these quickly. So, um, on your left, um, is Julia, who's a charcoal specialist at um, Oxford Archaeology. So she's doing a project about hedgerows. She's working with um, current nature conservation um, teams in the Oxford area um, to look at the sort of the, the archaeological remains, if you like, of um, managing hedges. And she's using that to um, then reflect upon if we can develop better ways of um, identifying hedges in prehistory. Um, and, you know, charcoal is a, an underused data set in archaeology, so it's a really good area to be working on. The wild spaces study in the middle, um, I'll let you decide which of the archaeologists in that picture is from development-led archaeology, <laughs> and which one's not in high by, um, <laughs> or not. <laughs> um, but, so this is a study led by Lee Matthews, who's a pollen specialist and a computational modelling specialist. She's using, she's taking um, new um, environmental samples um, from the, the Thames Valley region, um, but she's also been using old environmental samples that have only been partly analysed, um, and she'll be um, bringing those, the data seamlessly together into sort of develop a more interpretive model of the wild spaces, the sort of gaps in between the very dense archaeology in the Thames Valley. Um, and then on the right, uh, this is a study of how wild or not horses were um, over the duration of prehistory. So this is Martin Allen, who is now project manager at Oxford Archaeology, 
working with a bioarchaeologist, Alice Dodson, um, and this is um, both the Wild Spaces and Human um, Resource Relationships projects we're doing with um, the University of Oxford, um, then the horse study we're doing with the University of Exeter, and also um, CAGT Toulouse. Um, so we're doing a DNA Institute as well. So I won't say much about this bit. This is really about sort of leading um, cross-disciplinary um, in, uh, initiatives in, in archaeology. And Ruth Pelley can come back and we ask the question after the last talk. Um, she gave a whole talk about this yesterday. So those of you who attended the um, debate session will have listened to this already. So I won't say much. But um, obviously the image on the, on the left is just to remind us that um, Archaeology has a, sort of, um, a very long-term issue uh, with its data. It was work in progress in 1992 when that image was created, and it's still work in progress. But that's okay, because we're all working on it quite hard. Um, the, so we're using the Oasis 5 platform, um, which is uh, the, you know, the routine way in which um, evidence gets from development uh, projects gets uh, archived in British archaeology, but we're using its new capacity to have specialist modules um, uh, to, point, to design post specialist data. And really the idea is that, you know, when a uh, uh, fantastic specialist finishes their report, they fill in a simple form with key data which will help people identify um, the assemblages they want to use for research or to contextualise their sites. Um, and also possibly um, signpost where those data are deposited in an archive, in a digital archive. So this work has um, involved um, firstly asking what specialists want, which I felt was really important. So even before the, the, the project started, um, I developed this survey with colleagues in Historic England, um, which is really just asking, what do you currently do with your data? How much do people actually know about the archiving process? Um, how much what sort of training the people need in, in order to sort of understand that process and data management better. But also when you've got that data accessible, what do you want to do with it um, and how, how do you want to use it? It's all in this paper here, so I don't need to say more about that. Um, and then uh, to, act, to actually design those modules, we've been working with probably 60 plus um, plants and animal, animal based specialists from across developer funded archaeology but also in, in universities um, because you've obviously got to consider a range of end users. Um, so we've had workshops, um, online meetings with a smaller working group and then sort of very involved um, GitHub discussions. Uh, and as one uh, workshop participant said, this is a significant opportunity to bridge the gap between academic research and the development led sector. So on to the last bit of my talk, hopefully I'm not going to run over And this is really about um, attending to important um, pressing sort of global issues now. Um, so we're increasingly bombarded by alarming news about biodiversity loss, and we've heard about that quite a lot in the last few days. Um, and the statistics from the recent State of Nature report is just one example of this. There's widespread recognition that um, we led to a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, in which human activities dominate planetary systems, and that Britain is one of the most nature depleted countries um, in the world. And the good thing is that ambitious targets have been set um, at a global level within the UK and by organisations we heard earlier from the National Trust um, in order to sort of remedy the situation. And of course, um, we can't claim that archaeology is the answer to the current eco-climate crisis. But the Rewilding Project and colleagues more widely at Oxford Archaeology are thinking hard about how to remain open to and optimistic about what archaeology can do. First thing to say is, this is not new. So, it was actually at Oxford Archaeology that George Lambrick set up um, a conference in 1985 about archaeology and nature conservation and said that work at this interface had been going on quietly for some time and deserves to be appreciated more widely. So maybe not much has changed. But actually things have changed 
and our current eco-climate uh, crisis has, and I think particularly the link between biodiversity loss and climate change, which sort of wasn't, you know, previously um, where we were at, has brought about a new urgency about instigating nature recovery. Habitat creation is underway on an unprecedented scale, involving a diverse set of non-specialists. And ecological interests and concerns are changing. Some people have claimed that there's, a historical, there's been a historical turn in nature conservation, which has, as yet archaeology hasn't really engaged with. Um, people are both a problem to nature conservation, and they're key to making it work. Um, and then there's also the economics of making nature recovery financially viable. So just a couple of ways in which um, Oxford Archaeology is, is sort of working on these questions. So um, one thing we've been thinking about hard is how well we actually understand the relationship between habitat creation practices and archaeology. So we've been doing um, a project with the Forestry Commission um, the Tree Roots and Archaeology Project, which I talked about briefly yesterday in the forestry session. Um, and we just heard yesterday uh, that uh, we've been given the um, go-ahead to move forward with um, a proposal we submitted to investigate archaeology and biodiversity in Echo. <laughs> this is our work with our nature recovery partners in Echo National Estate. Really, this is, has thus far been mainly about listening to what are they interested in. Um, what, how can we tailor our research to what they want? Um, and one key example is um, the horse study that I mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, they have a, a, a quaternary safari in which they talk about um, the horses on their estate who operate as large herbivores. Um, so that really was the origin of why we started investigating horses as part of the project. I'm going to skip over this last one, but we need to think about biodiversity footprints as well as carbon footprints. And I know a lot of development-led organisations are thinking more about this kind of thing. <coughs> and we're doing it hopefully with also our colleagues at the University of Oxford. So I just want to finish with an advert. Um, as part of our um, sort of increasingly close work with uh, colleagues at, at the University of Oxford, we are asked this year to host um, the Fortical Conference of the Association of Environmental Archaeology. Um, it will be in December um, in Oxford. Um, it's called Past Environments for Emerging Worlds. And um, really one key question we want to ask is, what does the world and what does the future want of environmental archaeology? So if you're interested in that question, um, go have a look on the website and um, come along. Thank you.